For blood test number six in 2022, we saw that my biological age using Levine's test was 34.5 years, which is 15.2 years younger than my chronological. Similarly, when using aging.ai, that gave me a predicted age of 33 years, which is 16.7 years younger than my chronological. So what's contributing to these data? First, let's take a look at supplements. Well, if you're a regular watcher of this channel, then the first one shouldn't be a surprise. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my 20s, so I've been taking levothyroxine for about half of my life. And then I restarted vitamin D on October 1st, so about the last three weeks before the test. So I didn't take any vitamin D for the first six weeks as I was getting regular sun exposure. And that's it. No other supplements, including geroprotectors or senolytics. Which then brings us to diet. So we can see that this blood test was on October 24th, but how does diet relate to that date? So how am I tracking diet? So the average daily dietary intake from the last blood test, which was on August 22nd, through the day before this blood test for blood test number six on October 23rd, so that 63 day period corresponds to blood test number six in 2022. So let's go through that approach for people who may not be familiar. So here we're looking at the calendar, August, September, and October. And as I mentioned, blood test number five was on August 22nd, whereas October 24th was blood test number six. And then we see those 63 days in between tests. Now, every day since April of 2015, I've weighed all of my food prior to intake. And then I enter those food amounts into an online tracking app known as Chronometer. And if you're interested in a discount link, that'll be in the video's description. I then enter daily chronometer data into a spreadsheet and the average intake for those 63 days, including individual food amounts, macro and micronutrients, corresponds to blood test number six. So each blood test since 2015 has a corresponding diet composition, which then allows me to calculate correlations. And based on that data, I alter my dietary intake to optimize blood biomarkers. So let's start off by taking a look at individual food amounts that corresponded to blood test number six in 2022. And that's what we can see here. So ranked in order in terms of amount in grams from the highest intake down to the lowest. This is the first half of the diet that corresponded to blood test number six, including the first 25 foods. So in, in terms of why are the top seven foods here, I covered that in test number four. And if you're interested in that video, it'll be in the right corner. What I'd like to focus on in this video is what's different for test number six when compared with test number five. There were a whole bunch of little experiments that I tried, so let's go through each one of those. So first, I switched back to strawberries, whereas for the last test, I was mostly using a three-berry mix of strawberries, blackberries, and blueberries. So correspondingly, we can see that my strawberry intake increased from 289 grams per day to 547 grams per day. And also we can see that blackberries and blueberries decreased from 144 grams per day each down to about 32 grams per day. So there were two main reasons why I prefer to go with strawberries over the combination of blackberries and blueberries. Uh, first is that strawberries have a relatively lower fructose content per 100 calories when compared with the same amount of calories, 100 calories from black, blackberries and blueberries. So strawberries have 6.8 grams, whereas the combination of blackberries and blueberries to get 100 calories has 8.3 grams. And that's important because in my data, a relatively higher fructose intake is significantly correlated with more blood biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So I try to limit as much as possible overall fructose intake. And the other reason for focusing on strawberries is that they have a net correlative score with big picture biomarkers that I've covered in other videos of positive four. In other words, a relatively higher strawberry intake is significantly correlated with uh, lower levels of the liver enzyme AST, lower levels of high sensitivity C-reactive protein, lower LDL, and lower platelets. And those are each going in the right direction in terms of aging or all-cause mortality risk. So I've, given the, uh, I've, I've made them green. If it was red, they'd be going in the wrong direction in terms of aging and or all-cause mortality risk. My average strawberry intake since I started tracking food intake is 356 grams per day. And in terms of the rules, in terms of following these correlations, that suggests that I should eat above my average intake because a positive score, a positive correlative score, I would try to eat above my average intake. So with that, 547 is higher than 356. So I give it a check because I'm following that correlation. 
Now, with the goal of optimizing as many blood biomarkers as possible, I think it makes the most sense to follow also as many correlations as possible. I don't know which food or macro and micronutrients will impact the given biomarker, but if I follow the data, if I follow the correlations as much as I can, I'd expect for the best biomarker profile to, res uh, to result, and that may be one reason underlying my relatively youthful biological ages using Levine's test and aging.ai. All right, now whereas strawberries have a net positive correlative score with big picture biomarkers, conversely, blackberries and blueberries each have negative correlative scores of minus two and minus three respectively. And with average intakes of more than 111, 111 grams per day each, that suggests the, the net negative correlative score suggests that I should eat below that. And I did, 32 is less than more than 111. So I get green checks because I'm following those correlations. Now, next, I also, uh, made a small but significant reduction for red bell pepper intake, 233 to 227 grams per day. Uh, now, red bell peppers have a net correlative score with big picture biomarkers of negative four. Although they are significantly correlated with higher levels of albumin as shown in green, they're also significant, significantly correlated with higher levels of AST, creatinine, neutrophils, plate, and platelets, which are going in the wrong direction in terms of aging and or all-cause mortality risk, and they're also significantly correlated with a lower percentage of lymphocytes. My average red bell pepper intake since I started tracking food intake in 2018, I started tracking macros and micros in 2015. Unfortunately, I didn't have the idea to track food going all the way back to 2015, and I wish I did. Nonetheless, my red bell pepper average intake since I started tracking food intake is 293 grams per day, and because 227 is less than that, which is what we'd want to do with a net negative correlative score, we give that a green check. Now, note that red bell peppers have a net negative correlative score, and a criticism that I've, I've gotten a few times is, why not just take them out? For the net negatives, just take them out. Maybe it's completely bad. Well, red bell peppers are one of the few foods that are a concentrated source of the carotenoid beta-cryptoxanthin. And that's important because relatively higher blood levels of beta-cryptoxanthin are significantly correlated with a younger epigenetic age which is what we can see here. So here we've got blood levels of beta-cryptoxanthin. The epigenetic clock in this case is GrimAge, DNAM, DNA methylation. Uh, so it's GrimAge epigenetic clock, which is one of the best epigenetic clocks for its association with all-cause mortality risk. And we can see that the relatively higher blood levels of beta-cryptoxanthin were significantly correlated with a younger uh, GrimAge, as shown by the BICOR and the p-value. All right, so moving along, I also reduced barley intake from about 59 grams per day for test number five to 40 grams per day for test number six. Barley has a net positive score in my data of plus three. It's significantly correlated with higher homocysteine and triglycerides, which you can see I have red there. Those are going in the wrong direction in terms of aging and or all-cause mortality risk. But then it's got five biomarkers that it's inversely correlated, significantly inversely correlated with in green. And when I say significantly, note that that's a p-value less than 0.05. So uh, barley intake, since I started tracking food intake in 2018, my average is 14 grams per day with a net positive correlative score that suggests I should eat more than my average. And because 40 is higher than 14, we give it a green check. Now, although for this test, I wanted by cutting the barley from 59 to 40 grams, I wanted to address the question, although its correlative score is positive, how high is too high? In other words, above 14 grams per day, what's the upper barley limit to simultaneously optimize each of these seven biomarkers? And I should say that when considering its positive significant correlation with homocysteine and triglycerides, both of those came down a bit uh, for this test when compared with the last test, whereas the other biomarkers in green didn't change much at all. So uh, based on these data, it's possible that somewhere around 40 grams within the context of everything else in my diet, of course, may be uh, optimal for me relative to a relatively higher barley intake of 59 grams per day. All right, so that's the first half of the, of the diet. Let's take a look at, at what was different for test to test from, uh, from test to test for the other half. And here's the other half using the same approach, ranked in order from highest uh, intake in grams uh, to lowest intake uh, in grams too. So we've got uh, all 50 foods that I ate or over this 63 day period. And I should say there are two exceptions to the uh, listing, listing it in grams. Green tea, I listed in ounces. Uh, and pizza, I listed in calories, number, ranked at number 31. But we'll get more into that in a bit. All right, so the first thing that we can see that I changed from test to test, five to six, was flaxseed intake. Increased it from about 12 grams to about 16 grams per day. Flaxseeds in my data have a net correlative score of plus four. They're significantly correlated with lower neutrophils, creatinine, uh, HDL, LDL, and platelets. 
uh, sorry, and also red blood cells. And you can see that five of those are going in the right direction in terms of aging and or all-cause mortality risk, whereas that correlation for HDL is going in the wrong direction. So lower HDL will be worse. My average flaxseed intake since 2018 is 9.7 grams per day. So with a net positive correlative score, I would try to eat above my average intake. And because 16 is higher than 9.7, we give that a green check. Now note that for test number five, I was at 11.8 grams per day, which is which was already higher than my average intake, which is following the correlation. So why did I further increase flax seeds for this test? Now, one of the biomarkers that flax seeds are significantly correlated with is creatinine. And for, from test five to test six, uh, I was able to reduce creatinine from 1.04 to 0.98 milligrams per deciliter. Now, I'd like to have uh, creatinine levels that are even lower, somewhere around 0.9 milligrams per deciliter, which is the low end of my range since uh, 20, 2015 since I started tracking blood, uh, doing blood testing so often. Now my average creatinine level since uh, 2015 is 0.95. So uh, 0.98 isn't much different from 0.95, but I'd like to further improve that down to 0.9 or so. If correlation equals causation, and if flax seeds somehow impact creatinine, I thought it made sense where if I further increase flax seeds, I should see further reductions for creatinine. And so far so good. I'm gonna actually try to go a little bit higher and try to find that upper limit um, again, if correlation equals causation in terms of creatinine for flax seeds. All right, next up on the list are peanuts. So I increased them from none, none, zero grams per day, up to 12 grams per day. And the major reason is because peanuts are a good source of niacin. And one of the goals was to keep niacin relatively high, so more than 40 milligrams per day. And we'll go into that in another video. Uh, and that was to make up for the uh, niacin reduction by cutting barley. So barley is also a good source of niacin. So by cutting barley, I cut niacin, but by including peanuts, I was able to keep niacin relatively high. Now, peanuts have a net score of zero. It's not significantly correlated with, uh, it's, co it's significantly correlated with an equal amount of biomarkers going in the wrong and right direction, which gives it a net score of zero, which suggests that I should eat my average intake, which is 2.6 grams per day since 2018. So we can see that 12.3 is higher than 2.6. So I give that an X. So I'm not following that correlation. All right, so next up are pistachios. So I went from 11 grams per day down to 9.9, .9, and that's a significant difference. The two groups, 63 days for this period versus however many days were that corresponded to test number five. Now, one reason I did that is because, uh, and one gram a day may not seem like much, but uh, let's take a look at why I did that. So pistachios are a great source of melatonin, and I'll put that link, the link for that paper in the video's description. So in a few days, I purposely didn't eat them to limit the morning sleepiness that can come with too much melatonin. Now whether that was related to just some mild sleep that, that had nothing to do with pistachios or indeed from too much uh, melatonin coming from uh, eating pistachios on too many consecutive days, I don't know, but that was one of the reasons that I cut their intake. Now, in terms of their correlations, they have a net correlative score of plus four, and you can see the biomarkers there. So based on my average intake of 2.1 grams, that suggests with a cor positive correlative score, I should eat above my average intake. And because 9.9 .9 is higher than 2.1, we give that a check. All right, next up are eggs. So I increased it from zero grams per day up to seven. And the main reason for that is be to do the dietary cholesterol DHEA sulfate experiment. And if you missed that, it, uh, that video will be in the right corner. I also increased Brazil nut intake from 3.4 grams per day up to 4.7. Now, Brazil nuts are a rich source of selenium. Selenium is required for conversion of the thyroid hormone T4 into its active form, T3. So uh, did the ratio T3 to T4 improve because selenium is there and selenium you know, may improve the conversion of T4 to T3? So I have two data points. So this is very preliminary data uh, for the T3 to T4 ratio. And I should mention that a relatively higher ratio is associated with reduced all-cause mortality risk. So a higher T3 to T4 ratio would be better in terms of uh, risk of death for all causes. So uh, I have a finger prick test that I did on October 3rd. So that ratio was 1.64. And the average selenium intake, my average selenium intake for the seven days prior to that test was 186 micrograms per day. Now I then tested by venipuncture on October 18th. So about two weeks later, and my T3 to T4 ratio was then 2.92, which is higher. Now I can't obviously evaluate statistical significance for those two ratios, 1.64 versus 2.92, but uh, the 272 micrograms per day for selenium for the seven days prior to that test is significantly higher versus the first test. So uh, whether it was selenium or some other factor that I ended up having a higher T3 to T4 ratio, including maybe it's a difference for venipuncture versus finger prick, I don't know, but the 
ratio, T3, T4, definitely went in the right direction uh, as my selenium intake also went up. And again, I don't know if that's causation. It could be lots of different things. So Brazil nuts, in terms of the correlations, they have a net correlative score in my data of minus two with uh, four biomarkers going the wrong direction in red and two going in the right direction in green. My average Brazil nut intake since I started tracking food intake is five grams per day. So when the cor net correlative score is negative, that suggests I should eat below my average intake. 4.7 is less than five. So we give that a green check. I also increased my ginger intake, and this is fresh ginger, not powdered, from 0 0.6 grams per day up to 1.9. And the major reason there is because ginger has a very positive uh, net correlative score of plus seven in my data with seven biomarkers going in the right direction in terms of aging and, all, and or all-cause mortality risk. My average ginger in intake since I started tracking food intake is 0 0.65 grams per day. And because 1.9 is higher than that, we give that a check following the correlation. All right, and then last for these foods, I increased clove intake and that may not seem like a big difference, 0 0.1 versus zero but the data showed it two sample t-tests two sample t-tests as significantly different at least nominally significant significantly different i can also already hear people yelling at me about adjusted p values but that's another story anyway the main reason why i increased my clove intake through diet is because although it's already in my homemade mouthwash with the goal of trying to optimize the oral microbiome and i'll put that video in the right corner too i think that adding ground cloves into the diet may also be a good idea and as the corollary for why i think that may be a good idea just like a dietary nitrate, the direct effect will be uh, an increase in oral nitrate in the mouth from the food, but also absorbing it through the blood and then secrete it back into, uh, to the, into the mouth by the uh, salivary glands. I think a similar possibility uh, is, is, is pos I think it's also possible for, by eating cloves, I may get some of the beneficial, uh, it's beneficial metabolites that can impact the salivary microbiome to be uh, absorbed into my salivary glands through the blood and then secreted into the mouth potentially optimizing my oral microbiome. Now that's the hypothesis. We'll see if that's true when I retest uh, for test number three for the salivary microbiome, which I haven't done yet. So my, uh, for cloves, they have a net correlative score of plus one. My average clove intake since 2018 is 0.13 grams per day. So since that's identical to what my average was for this test, and because the uh, correlative score was positive, that suggests I should go higher. So we give that an X. Now I've, I've been eating cloves more regularly since this test on October 24th. So uh, I'll be following this correlation for test number seven in 2022. All right, so what about junk? I haven't gone through that yet. My diet isn't always clean. Uh, so I do occasionally in, uh, add junk. And if I do, I try to stick to the day of, at, immediately after the blood test and the day after. Uh, for this uh, period, it was actually three days. So I had junk on three of the 63 days that corresponded to this test and no junk on 60 days. And for the junk, I had two slices of pizza. It was nothing special, Domino's, and I actually regretted eating it uh, after the fact. Uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll probably get some uh, higher quality pizza in a couple months when I travel on the East Coast to see my parents. And then uh, other junk was Nutella, which was on the day of and, and the day after the test. And I had to put 145 grams there because people have commented before where they thought that I was eating literally 2.3 grams of Nutella every day. But that's not the case. I had Nutella on two of the days that corresponded to the 63 for this test, and then nothing after that. And then last in terms of junk was Swedish fish, which is a type of candy. I had that just on one day, 60 grams, not one gram every day for 63 days. That would, that would be ridiculous. All right, so that's the first part of my diet analysis that corresponds to blood test number six in 2022. In part two of this series, we'll look at the macronutrient and micronutrient profile that corresponded to test number six. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, you can check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got some discount links that you may be interested in, including epigenetic testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you would just like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee, and all these links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.